It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the member for Temiskaming Cochrane. Thank, Thank you, Speaker. My question, uh, my first question, is to the acting premier. Frontline doctors and public health experts have been sounding the alarm about the premier's response to the second wave of COVID-19. Yesterday, the premier responded by suggesting that they hadn't read the plan. They hadn't read the whole plan. And he keeps insisting that infection rates have gone down. Hours later, Peel's medical officer of health responded, and I quote, regardless of what the province's new framework is saying, I must be clear. All of our metrics are going in the wrong direction, end of quote. Does the Ford government actually expect people to believe that this doctor working on the front lines just hasn't read the whole plan? The parliamentary assistant, the member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, our government has followed the best advice available from scientists and public health experts, and that's certainly what's happened with our COVID-19 framework that we put out recently. So we have been looking at all the available evidence and listening to all the available experts. As you can imagine, there is no shortage of opinion on, uh, from different doctors on what should and should not be done and where the lines should be drawn, but all we can do is make the best available uh, advice uh, available also to the public transparently, and that is what the COVID-19 framework does. It puts a, a framework out there for people to discuss, consider, and, uh, and uh, we can always adjust if need be in the future. But we believe it's a good framework based on the advice of our public health measures table and the advice of all the public health experts that we have consulted with across the province. Thank you. Supplementary question. Many doctors and health experts are raising serious concern about the Premier's plan. These are the people working in critical care units. These are the doctors running our public health units. And the Premier Times calls them armchair quarterbacks. If he's so confident, if the government is so confident about their plan, which the member on the government side just stated, why don't they show us the reports and studies that they're basing the plan on? Show us, actually be transparent with those reports and studies. The response, the parliamentary assistant. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Uh, our government has been very transparent all the way along. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, we have had daily briefings uh, with the public, with media available and uh, ready to ask questions. We've been here in the House answering questions, and uh, frankly, we've been producing the public health experts who give the government advice, the Chief Medical Officer of Health, the Associate Chief Medical Officer of Health, uh, for a while every day, and now two days a week for, uh, for questions. We have been extremely public and transparent, and recently we have just released this COVID-19 framework, which transparently uh, sets out the kinds of indicators and things that the, the public health measures table looks at and advises the chief medical officer of health about, and that is where the government does get its advice. So I believe the public has a great deal of information. We've also put out a dashboard recently on our uh, COVID-19 uh, website, which has been updated and is easy to use and access, available for anyone to look at at any time. We're all making the best information available so we can make the best decisions available. The final supplementary. Many public health experts would not, disagree, would not agree with that answer. The Premier has seemed to have squandered many opportunities he had to prepare Ontarians for the second wave, and now cases are reaching all-time highs. It's clear that our communities need to bear down hard against the spread of COVID-19, and it's clear they need support. Long-term care homes need staff now. Testing and contact tracing needs boosting now. And businesses and hard-hit communities need direct financial supports now. Instead of adding more chaos and confusion, will the Premier finally deliver what the province needs to weather the second wave now? Again, the parliamentary assistant to reply. 
Thank you, Speaker. Our government is committed to using every resource possible to protect the health and well-being of all Ontarians, and that's why we unveiled this fall our comprehensive $2.8 billion Keeping Ontarians Safe, Preparing for Future Waves of COVID-19 plan. And that plan looks to build upon current measures in place and introduce new and innovative policies to ensure that our province is prepared to respond to several scenarios. And the plan includes uh, helping prevent illness and protecting communities by identifying six key key areas, including maintaining strong public health measures, implementing the largest flu immunization vaccine campaign in Ontario's history, quickly identifying outbreaks, Order. accelerating efforts to clear health backlogs, uh, preparing for surges of COVID-19, and recruiting, retaining, training, and supporting our health care workers. This is a great plan. It's led to uh, unprecedented levels of testing. Up to 50,000 uh, tests we're able to do now, and nothing really will stop this government from putting every resource to protecting the health and safety of all Ontarians. Thank you. The next question. Again, the member for Timiskaming and Cochrane. Question. This next question is also to the Acting Premier. The government wants to rush through its bill that is going to let long-term care home operators off the hook for legal liability. After 2,000 seniors lost their lives in long-term care, the government set up hearings for the bill. But instead of doing all they can in a pandemic to make sure that everyone who wants to participate can, they are doing the exact opposite. The government, and this is, this is hard to believe, the government scheduled hearings in a room without webcast ability. In other words, no one was able to watch the proceedings. Why Question. is the government suppressing the hearings instead of ensuring that the public, who is very interested, can actually see debate on Thank you. The government has stated. Um, actually, a bit surprised at, at the question from the, the honourable member. I, from my understanding is that he is a committee chair, and he will know that the government does not schedule what rooms uh, committee hearings take place, and that uh, uh, members and the committee chair will uh, will uh, entertain uh, motions from uh, members asking uh, for uh, certain committee rooms. Having said that, Mr. Speaker, uh, this government did recognize, uh, certainly during COVID, uh, that uh, there was a deficiency in, in, in all of the committee rooms, in many of the committee rooms, with respect to broadcasting. Uh, that is why the government uh, did ask the Board of Internal Economy early on uh, to uh, ensure that going forward, all of the committee rooms have uh, uh, are available for uh, uh, for to be televised, Mr. Speaker. It's a, a step that is long overdue, uh, and uh, and I appreciate the fact uh, that this government is ensuring that all Ontarians uh, going forward will have access Response. to all of the committee rooms. It's something that should have been done many years ago, Mr. Speaker, uh, and I look forward to that being done very soon. Thank you. And a supplementary question, Speaker, for the safety of Ontarians, this building is closed to the public. We appreciate that. That's exactly why a bill with this much interest should have had public hearings available to watch online or on TV. The government knows there's an interest. 58 individuals signed up at short notice to speak to the bill, but only 15 were allowed. And not surprisingly, the government did not prioritize a single family who lost loved ones in long-term care. Why is this government doing everything it can to ensure this legislation that limits the liability of private long-term long care providers gets the full public hearing it deserves? Why? Why is it not opening up so everyone Question. can see? Thank you. Again, the government house leader. Uh, again, Mr. Speaker, uh, the committee, to the best of my knowledge, did not receive a request uh, uh, from the members opposite, uh, either from the official opposition or from uh, the independents on the committee, uh, to ensure that the committee was, was a televised uh, committee. There was no request that was made, Mr. Speaker. Uh, at the same time, with respect to uh, who presented in front of the committee, the same process was used as has been used for all committees. Members of the opposition have an opportunity to, uh, uh, to select the members that they want to appear before the committee, to highlight the ones that they 
feel are important. The government did not make a decision on that. The government did not step in uh, to stop people from uh, from presenting. My understanding, Mr. Speaker, is, is that I believe it was the member for Orleans, if I'm not mistaken, that was filibustering the committee, which resulted in fewer members uh, appearing before the committee, uh, Mr. Speaker. But at no time did this government have any decision to play in whether the committee was televised Response? or who would appear in front of the committee, Mr. Speaker. I would suggest to the member opposite, who is a committee chair, uh, that uh, in future, if he wants a room change or a televised uh, committee hearing, that he make that request. Any final supplementary? Speaker, uh, the government has a majority in the committee, so the government can make changes at committee. Speaker, families deserve answers from their government. They deserve to know exactly who has lobbied for these changes. In our caucus, we believe families and survivors should have their voice heard. It appears the government is so ashamed of their own legislation, they want to clamp down on how much the public knows about it. The government knows there is more interest in this bill. They have the majority on the committee. They control the agenda of the committee. But in the end, the government, the government members, will the government do the right thing and open up more time in committee in a webcast room for the public to share their views on the legislation so all the people who applied to be heard can be heard. Thank you, Speaker. Yeah. Government House Leader. Uh, I, I, again, Mr. Speaker, I, my understanding is that the, this bill has been dealt with uh, with respect uh, uh, through an order of this House, which all members had an opportunity uh, to vote on. Uh, it is also my understanding, and if the member has information to the opposite, that no motion or request was made of the committee to transfer the room uh, from where the hearings were held into a room where uh, uh, that could be televised. If the member opposite has, uh, has that request, I would certainly like to look at it, but I have certainly not seen any request. The member will also know that subcommittee are equal uh, in this uh, in this place. The government does not hold a, a, a majority on the subcommittees. It is one member of the opposition, one member of the government. The member will also know, Mr. Speaker, uh, that the opposition has the ability to prioritize what witnesses they would like to see at committee. So I would suggest to the member opposite, if he is unaware of all of these things, that we can certainly arrange a refresher course for him and for the members opposite. Spons? As a committee chair, I'm surprised that he does not know <clears throat> this, but I would suggest to the member, stop politicizing that is so important for so many people across the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. In the absence of them getting the job done, we will. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for London, Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, my London colleagues and I have repeatedly implored your government to ensure the increased number of folks needing testing would have access to tests and timely results. In a press conference last week, London's Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Mackey, warned the contact tracing is not effective if it takes people a week to get their back the results. And yet, testing backlogs persist in London. Yesterday, just over 28,000 results were posted, while 33 are still waiting to be processed. And that's a far cry from the 50,000 tests per day your government promised Ontarians. Meanwhile, parents and kids are left in limbo, wondering if it's safe to go back to work and back to school. Small businesses are forced to work short-staffed, and long-term care residents are separated from their central caregiver. Will this government take immediate action to address the backlogs in London? The member for Eglinton Lawrence and parliamentary assistant. Thank you, Speaker. Our government recognizes how important testing is in defeating COVID-19, and we've made it clear that testing is a priority. The sooner we can identify the cases, the sooner we can stop the spread of the virus. And it's important for the member opposite to remember that testing is demand-driven. And I also want to be clear that any person who needs a test, according to the guidelines, will receive a test. And uh, right now, you can book them immediately. Um, and 80% of results are, are being reported within 24 to 48 hours across the province. And while there are always tests in progress, uh, the situation is now stabilized. And uh, I can assure you there is no backlog. It takes time for the test to be taken time for the test to be transported, time for the lab to run the test. So there's always going to be tests in the pipeline. And unless it exceeds our capacity, which is now about 50,000 tests, it is not a backlog. Those are tests we will process the next day, and the results will be available within the 24 to 48 hour period. Thank you. Great. Uh, Speaker, Speaker, Leora is a central caregiver to her mom, who's 101 years old in long-term care. So time is very important to them, and to her and her mother. She wrote me in quote, 
This is what she said. This past Wednesday, I went for my regular two-week testing. It is now five, going on six days, since I was tested with no results. I cannot see my mother without results. Just advising the home that I was tested is not enough. The system is broken. The effect on our elderly is appalling. While my mother's physical needs are very well attended to, the staff does not have the time to attend to her emotional needs. They are doing their best, but, the but they need family to help. Safety is first and foremost for her and others in the home, but without improved response time for providing results, precious time is being lost." End quote. Will this government commit to provincial, local public health units the resources and supports they need so essential caregivers aren't forced to waste precious time waiting for results? Parliamentary assistant to reply. Thank you, Speaker. Our government is committed to ensuring that Ontarians can continue to get tested and receive their results in a timely manner. And that's why our government is investing over a billion dollars to expand the capacity of our provincial lab network so that more tests can be processed and ensure that the labs have the resources they need to meet our provincial testing targets. And they have. And this investment will include uh, hiring more staff, more lab staff, more professional staff, improving data quality through digitizing records acquisition forms and other automated features. And I would also like to remind the member opposite that Ontario Health has made it clear that long-term care homes and other congregate care settings have priority at provincial labs, especially those in up outbreak scenarios. It's also critical that we remember that this province has completed over 5 million tests. That's a third of our population. Our government will continue to work with our sector partners around the province to make sure that testing turnaround times continue to improve so that Response. Ontarians do not experience any untimely delays in receiving their test results. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Oakville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, my question is to the Minister of Long-Term Care. We know that wait lists for long-term long care have grown significantly after the, over the last decade and a half, and that was prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. The minister has spoken frequently in the House about the ongoing work being done to repair and rebuild our long-term care system. On Tuesday, you announced that the government is selling surplus land to build three new long-term care homes, accounting for almost 900 new beds. Wow. Given the urgent need to add new capacity to provide the tens of thousands of people on the long-term care wait list with the care that they need, can the minister please explain to this House what our government is doing to build new long-term care beds and how this announcement will help for the capacity of the people of Oakville. Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from uh, Oakville uh, for his advocacy on this file. Thank you. We are delivering on our commitment to transition our seniors from wait lists to modern long-term care homes, providing a warm and safe environment with the quality of care that they deserve. Developing long-term care homes on surplus government lands will help address barriers often faced by long-term care operators, such as the limited supply of available land, particularly in urban areas. In Oakville, this will mean an additional 512 long-term care beds that will be located at 2165 Dundas Street West. This is just one piece of our government's commitment to building 30,000 new long-term care beds over 10 years. And, Speaker, our government will continue to deliver on that response. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Minister. That's great news for the people of Oakville and, and everyone in Ontario, really. That's phenomenal. Speaker, many citizens of, of Oakville have written to my office raising their concerns about access to long-term care. I am glad to hear that progress is being made in my community and across the province of Ontario. This is a critical step towards improving the quality of life for people on the wait list and their families. The fact is, the previous Liberal government built only 611 beds between 2011 and 2018, while the over-75 population grew by over 170,000 people. Speaker, this government was elected by the people of Ontario in part because of our plan to address bed capacity and long-term care. So I'm glad to see us building nearly as many in one project, and I'm glad to see the project is, one of the projects is in my community. Can the minister please explain what else this government is doing to rapidly address capacity shortages in long-term care? Thank you. Mr. Long-term care. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, thanks again for the question to the member from Oakville. 
Working together with our sector partners, our government continues to use innovative ideas and modern solutions to pursue an aggressive modernization agenda for long-term care. Developing these three long-term care homes on surplus government land will add almost 900 new long-term care beds to the system. But our government knows that more has to be done to improve capacity. And this past summer, we announced the Accelerated Build Pilot Program, which is helping build new long-term care beds across the province in record speed that meet modern design standards, including air conditioning and private and semi-private rooms. Speaker, we have a plan to improve long-term care capacity and staffing that is much needed to coincide, and we will continue to do just that. Thank you. The next question, the member for Beaches East York. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Long-Term Care. Anne Baird, who lives in my riding, hasn't been able to help with her mother's care since the pandemic hit in March. Neither have her sisters. Anne's mother lives in Bertram Place, a retirement home in Dundas. She's over 90 and in failing health, and she desperately misses the, health, the care of her daughters. Despite the fact that there has been no COVID at the home and that her daughters qualify as essential caregivers, the home is not allowing her daughters to come into her room. Speaker, how is the minister ensuring that people like Anne's mom can have the help and visitors they need for the sake of their physical and mental well-being? The Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for that important question. Our government acknowledges and recognizes the importance of family caregivers or caregivers beyond the family for our residents in long-term care. Their emotional well-being is our focus as well as their physical safety and health. We understand the homes. We understand the situation that some of the homes are in, uh, but as you mentioned, homes that are not in outbreak uh, do have an obligation to allow the caregivers, essential caregivers. Each resident can um, identify two caregivers, and those caregivers should be allowed into the home. This is something that we will continue to work with our sector partners on, to understanding the needs of our residents, the needs of their families, and the needs of the staff and residents, other residents in the home to be kept safe. So all of this is an effort uh, to, to address an issue that was long-standing over co the first COVID wave, and uh, we understand the issue. We're continuing to work with our partners to make sure that the access to, to family Response. members, essential caregivers, is done. So thank you very much. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Anne, her sisters, and their families have been limiting their exposure to others in order to ensure that there's no chance that they could possibly transmit COVID to their mom or inadvertently bring it into the home. It's cruel to deprive Anne's mom of the loving care of her daughters when there's absolutely no health reason to do so. Anne's mom needs her daughters, as the minister has acknowledged. And this is why the NDP's proposed legislation to fix this problem and allow individuals receiving care and their caregivers to have a voice. When will the minister listen to the families and pass that bill? Thank you. Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, we are constantly uh, monitoring the situations within our homes, and again, our government recognizes the importance of essential caregivers and family members for our residents. Uh, and that emotional well-being of our residents is really something that I, I very much take to heart. As a daughter of a family member, of my, my parent who was in long-term care, I know how much it means to families to visit, and I used to take my mother regularly to do that. So um, it is something that is very close to my heart. And I will continue to make sure that we take every measure possible, work with our homes, listen to our families, Order. and continue to address the situation that means so much uh, to families and residents in long-term care. We will be on this continually. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the uh, Minister of Long-Term Care. At Ottawa's Starwood Long-Term Care Home, there are 79 cases, resident cases of COVID-19, 19 staff cases, nine residents have died. It makes it one of the worst outbreaks in the province. So, Speaker, I've said before, COVID-19 is like a brush fire. Once it start, starts inside a home, it's hard to control. So at Starwood, the home's operator has said in an email, admitted in an email, that delays in testing contributed to the spread of COVID-19. And it's not the first time we've heard that in the second wave. And it's not good enough to say 
we make it a priority. It actually has to happen. Delays in testing mean delays in cohorting and sending staff home, and the minister knows that's how residents get sick. Question. So, can the minister tell us why those things, testing is not in place to protect every resident in long-term care? The parliamentary assistant. As I said before, our government is committed to ensuring that Ontarians can rely on test results and test results coming back in a timely manner. And that's why we invested a billion dollars in our testing strategy, so that we can have more lab capacity and get those tests turned around as quickly as possible. And that's what we've been doing. Uh, we've hired more lab staff, we've hired more professional staff, we've improved the data quality uh, with digitizing requisition forms and other automated features. And 80% of tests across the province are being returned within 24 to 48 hours. So frankly, that's a lot of uh, tests. We've tested over 5 million Ontarians. Long-term care homes are prioritized for testing results, and long-term care homes in outbreak are at an even higher priority for test results. Thank you, Speaker. The supplementary question. Well, you don't know an outbreak until you do the tests. 89 long-term care homes are in outbreak this morning. And earlier this year at Ottawa's West End Villa, 20 residents died of COVID-19. You look at the dashboard, you don't see the cases. You do see the deaths. And both West End Villa and Starwood are a 15-minute drive from the minister's constituency office. And what happened at these homes are both very serious. And every day it's really discouraging to hear the minister downplay the number of cases in the legislature on social media as if it was somehow minimized by the minority of homes being in outbreaks. You can't minimize the impact of COVID-19, and it's the minister's responsibility to protect every resident in long-term care. The bottom line is the things that need to be in place, like testing, are not there for everyone. Question. So my question to the minister is this. What are you going to ensure a timely test turnaround for every resident in long-term care. Thank you. Parliamentary Assistant to reply. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the question. As I've indicated in answer to several questions, we have ensured a timely test turnaround. 80% of tests are being returned within 24 to 48 hours. We are working on improving that even further so that we get up to 90% of tests being returned within that period of time. It would be wonderful if we could get to 100% of tests be being returned within that period of time. But we have invested a billion dollars in testing. Uh, testing is a high priority for this government, testing especially for long-term care residents and long-term care uh, facilities, which are in outbreak, is the highest priority in that list, and hospitals as well, because we know how important it is to get those tests turned around quickly. Obviously, we're very concerned with any uh, institution, long-term care home or uh, hospital that is in outbreak, and we want to do our best to make sure that we contain and, and uh, isolate the cases as best possible to ensure Response. that the health and, uh, and safety of all of the residents is protected. Thank you. The next question, the member for Barry Innisfil. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. As you know, he's always building up success in this province, but it's no secret that there is a looming labour shortage in this province, with a third of journey persons in Ontario at nearing retirement age and the average apprentice being at the age of 29 years. The government needs to do more work, it's clear, to bring more people into the trades. And there's hundreds and thousands of jobs that are available across our province that can transform the lives of many people, be they many young people, women, new immigrants. There's an opportunity for all these individuals to support a meaningful, high-paying, successful career. But there often is many barriers, and I wanted to ask the Minister of Labour, Training uh, and Skills Development what he can tell us as to what he's doing to build up success for all those people, no matter their background. Great question. Minister of Labour. Well, thank you very much, and I want to thank uh, the member from Barrie Innisfil for this important question and for uh, really working uh, within our government to get more young people into the trades. Mr. Speaker, ensuring that these good paying jobs, often jobs with pensions and benefits in the skilled trades, get filled over the next few years. This is our government's mission, Mr. Speaker. Filling these jobs is vital to keeping our province competitive. Uh, for the future in building what our communities need. As part of our skilled trade strategy, we've made investments in the trades right across the province. 
Our government recently announced $43 million, which includes teaching kids from grade one about the skilled trades to encourage them to pursue a career in the trades. Additionally, the Premier and I recently announced an additional $2 million to help racialized and disadvantaged job seekers train for these great careers. Response? This included $500,000 for youth employment services in Toronto to help with cloud computing and programming training for 100 racialized youth. Mr. Speaker, our government believes that good, meaningful jobs change lives. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the supplementary question. Well, thank you, Minister, for the uh, for the answer. And there's no question that COVID-19 has taken a toll on many sectors, but especially on women's economic uh, position when it comes to STEM, manufacturing, and the construction sector. And I know the Minister of Women, Children's, and uh, Women and Children has been doing many, uh, you know, has been doing many tours across the province to encourage more women to get into the skills trades and working with kick-ass careers. And you see the opportunity across our province for these women with high-paying jobs, huge demand in our economy to tap tackle uh, many of the barriers. Some of these women are going to the trades, but not all. So can the minister please tell us what is she doing to get more women into the skills trades? The Associate Minister of Children and Women's Issues. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Barry Innisfel, who is also a great neighbouring MPP. Mr. Speaker, the member is right. We know that women have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic, both at home and in the workplace, and we are committed to ensuring that women are not left behind as we reopen Ontario's economy. Our government continues to stand and fight for all Ontario workers, including women, and are working to encourage them to pursue careers in the skilled trades and STEM sector. This past month, I had the pleasure of visiting the Women in Skilled Trades program at the Burlington Centre for Skills, Skills Development. Over the course of their 22-week program, women are equipped with the carpentry tools and training they need to launch successful careers in the construction industry. Alongside the Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development, we announced an investment of $75 million over the next two years to help apprentices cover living expenses during their in-class training. Response. Mr. Speaker, our work does not end here. We will continue to fight for women across Ontario to make sure they are aware of the opportunities in the skilled trades and to support them along their pathway. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Speaker. And today, my question is for the Acting Premier. On Tuesday, Kingston City Council passed a motion urging this government to extend the eviction ban for arts venues for six more months. Entrepreneur Wendy Hewitt, owner of our beloved independent cinema, The Screening Room, has seen a 75% drop in attendance since the pandemic began and says they are hemorrhaging thousands and thousands of dollars per month. Like many others, this business could not access this province's commercial rent subsidy. Arts organizations across Ontario desperately need stability and the assurances of support now. If these spaces are forced to close, who are we kidding? They are not going to open again, Speaker. With that in mind, will this government please step up and extend the commercial eviction ban for arts venues for six more months? The Parliamentary Assistant and Member for Willowdale. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And thanks to the member opposite for raising this important issue. The, the arts uh, industry, as many, as many businesses throughout Ontario, have been facing a very difficult time from the onset of this pandemic. And that's why this government put away partisan differences, worked with all, multiple, all levels of government across all party lines, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that we provided a coordinated system of support. And that's what this government's done. Our, our part has been $30 billion in direct relief. $241 million of that went to the commercial rent relief program, which has aided over 617,000 employees here in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Of course, there is a new rent program that the federal government has announced. Uh, this will be tenant-led, as we heard at the Standing Committee on Finance of Economic Affairs. There is more to be done. There's no question about it, and that's why I look forward in a few hours to table our next step for the COVID-19 response to make sure that we protect, support, and recover here in the province of Ontario. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and, and respectfully to the member opposite, I was asking for an eviction ban to be extended for six months, and I do hope that that is part of the budget this afternoon, because all the programs in the world won't matter if these landlords decide to evict these tenants from those locations. The arts and culture sector makes huge contributions to the economy and the well-being of our communities. And earlier this summer, with the member opposite, 
uh, the world-renowned Toronto International Film Festival testified at the Standing Committee on Finance and Economic Affairs and told us how it generates more than 200 million in annual economic activity, creates over a thousand jobs, and reaches approximately 850 million people worldwide. Arts and culture organizations and individual artists are the soul of our communities. They create spaces of joy and celebration. And with so many struggling with isolation right now, these outlets are Question. especially important in a province where we lack adequate mental health supports. Will the government provide additional funding for immediate and near-term uh, support in recognition of the increased costs experienced by these businesses and organizations? Member for Willowdale. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and, and again, thank you to the member for his concern for this very important industry, and certainly TIF, I think, was missed by all members of this House, as well as the valuable sector itself and the jobs it creates and the economic prosperity it brought to Ontario. Speaker, we still must protect and support those businesses. No, there's no question about that, and our government outlined that support in $30 billion of direct relief, and as I want to remind the member, this is a coordinated approach with our federal partners to make sure that we fill the gaps of the relief they provide. And that's why we've helped with $300 million in our recent announcement to help with additional fixed costs, to help with property taxes, to help with other taxes, and to keep hydro rates low, Speaker. There is absolutely more to be done as we move through the second wave, and that's why our budget will be an opportunity to table our next steps to make sure that we protect the hardworking business in the arts sector, to make sure that we support those businesses, and also look around the corner Response. to make sure that we have a plan for that day of recovery. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Simcoe Gray. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. Uh, Speaker, the uh, Simcoe Muskoka Catholic District School Board received approval and funding two and a half years ago to build a much needed school in the Treetops subdivision in Alliston. After meeting all the requirements, the board is still waiting for final sign off. Parents, students, staff, and trustees are beyond frustrated, and COVID 19 has only heightened their expectations. Ex, uh, exasperation. The pressure to limit overcrowding, reduce the use of portable classrooms, and allow for physical distancing is greater than ever. Will the minister put an end to the delays? Will he review this sorry situation with his department and see that the necessary approval to proceed to tender is finalized? Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for his question. Uh, the project noted, uh, as I understand, uh, the, the board had submitted a request for approval to proceed to tender in August of 2020. Uh, we have reviewed it. They've also come forth with a request to increase the project budget cost. Uh, we are reviewing the matter uh, since August. I appreciate very much the uh, community pressures in Alliston, a growing community in your riding. Uh, and I'll work with the deputy minister's office to make sure that the board gets an answer as soon as possible. The supplementary question. Back to the speaker, and I thank the uh, thank the minister for that question. Uh, hundreds of students are uh, are counting on you to uh, get this project moving forward. Uh, the new school will accommodate about just over 430 students, and those students right now are being bused to Beaton. Uh, Beaton's almost at capacity now uh, for the number of portables. I think we have eight portables. We're going to grow to 12 soon, which is the municipal limit at that school. And uh, it is a, a fast-growing part of the province, as all ministers know. Once the green belt went in, Simcoe County became the fastest-growing region in the province because you have to leap over the green belt and then you buy your house or your apartment or whatever in uh, in my riding and in other PC members' ridings. So, uh, in Simcoe County and Gray County. So, uh, appreciate anything you can do, Minister. Uh, time is of the essence, and I'm sorry it's fallen uh, on your watch. Uh, it should have been built years ago. <laughs> Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, and as noted, uh, so the board had come forth with a tender for approval in August. We are reviewing the matter expeditiously, appreciating that families in your community want to see action in a new school. And I think I, I very much agree that building schools during COVID uh, is important, at least for the medium term. Uh, to help relieve the accommodation pressures that are rising across communities, including in Alliston. Uh, we just announced with the Premier a $500 million investment in capital. This is actually the second uh, capital investment this calendar year, two intakes of over a billion dollars, roughly a billion dollars, to build new schools, to expand schools, and to build over 1,700 net new childcare spaces for working parents. There is clearly more to do, and I look forward to getting to work for the people of Ontario. Thank you. Next question, the member for Markham Thornhill. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My, my question to the Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Mr. Speaker, the first week in November each year is a Treaties Recognition Week in Ontario. The people of my riding know the importance of treaties with Markham being part of the Johnson Puddler purchases. Sometimes it's called the Hunshot Treaty. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell this House what our government is doing to highlight treaties and their significance in Ontario? Thank you. The uh, Parliamentary Assistant, Member for Peterborough Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Treaties Recognition Week is an opportunity to promote awareness and understanding of treaties that form the basis of our relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. Each year, Indigenous elders and knowledge keepers like Doug Williams from my riding share their story, stories through living library events that are viewed online and in schools across the province. This year, we've expanded our online programming to reach even more Ontarians. Mr. Speaker, recognizing the histories of treaties helps preserve Indigenous culture and traditions as we move forward together on the path of reconciliation. Having the knowledge holders tell these stories provides a much richer experience for other people to learn. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the parliamentary assistant for that uh, answer. I know many of my constituents are participating in the virtual living library event this week. Can the minister please tell this house what else our government is doing to honor this important week? Thank you. Parliamentary assistant. Thank you, Speaker. Our government is grateful to all the Indigenous leaders and educators who share their stories and perspectives each year for the Living Library Program. Additionally, Speaker, Ontarians can access many more resources, including our digital treaties map at ontario.ca slash treaties. I'd also like to share with the House that November 8th is National Aboriginal Veterans Day. May we honour the contributions of many First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples who proudly served this country during the First World War, the Second World War, the Korean War and every conflict since. Lest we forget the bravery and sacrifice of Indigenous veterans who answered the call and defended this country. Thank you. The next question, the member for London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Yesterday, the Minister said, while we have the ability to reach up to 50,000 tests per day, it is demand-driven, so it depends on the number of people that actually show up. Speaker, Londoners are showing up, but they are finding it hard to get tests. Arden Urbano needs a COVID test in order to travel for business. Her local pharmacy has designated just one hour per day for people without symptoms to call for an appointment. They must wait for a call back up to 48 hours later before they can book a test, often days out. Last week, she emailed me to express her frustration and described the government's testing strategy as a complete fail. Speaker, why is the minister blaming Ontarians for not getting tested instead of accepting her responsibility to meet testing targets? The parliamentary assistant, member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Speaker, and thank the member opposite for the question. Uh, as I've said many times, we recognize the importance of testing and testing turnaround times. We've made it clear that testing is a priority for our government, and we've put a billion dollars into enhancing our testing strategy. We have a capacity to do 50,000 tests at this time every day. However, we don't always have 50,000 tests to process every day. Uh, when we do, those tests are able to be processed, and we're working on improving that number to enhance our testing capacity even further. We're also expecting uh, rapid uh, tests to be approved by Health Canada and perhaps available across the country shortly, and that would be an, another initiative which would help testing turnaround times. It is possible that occasionally people do have to wait longer for tests, but as I said, 80 percent of the tests across, uh, across the province are coming in within 24 to 48 hours, and uh, we think that's a fairly good result, but we want to make it even better. Thank you. The supplementary question. 
Speaker, another constituent emailed me last week to ask why, when testing rates are half the provincial capacity, it took four days to get a COVID test appointment at the Oak Ridge Assessment Centre for her symptomatic teenage son. She wonders if confusing messaging and barriers to access testing are reducing numbers so the government can claim that people are not coming out. And this is exactly what we heard yesterday, Speaker, when the minister said, I'm not sure if the leader of the official opposition would like us to just go and grab people and bring them in for testing. Speaker, we don't want people to be grabbed. We want a plan for timely testing that meets provincial targets. When will we see it? Parliamentary assistant. Thank you, Speaker. We do have a plan for timely testing that meets provincial targets. We're doing that plan. We're executing that plan right now. We are meeting our targets. We're able to uh, uh, test uh, and process 50,000 tests a day at this time, and we're increasing that number every day. Uh, as to the member's suggestion that you cannot get an appointment for testing, I can't speak to the particular testing centre that you referred to, but I do know that within the City of Toronto, when I have gone on the websites of the various uh, testing centers. I've been able to get an appointment within an hour. Uh, so there are many uh, testing facilities available, um, and we have 160 assessment sites set up around the province. Uh, there, there are lots of testing sites available, and I hope that people will be able to get the tests and get the results as quickly as possible. That's certainly what our plan is working toward. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Don Valley West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. I've asked about the expansion of the mandate of uh, Canada Christian College a number of times in this legislature, as many of us have from this side of the floor. I continue to be deeply concerned, not about the PCAB process, which the minister uses as a shield when he answers questions, but rather about the legislation that essentially preempts the objective process. The well-known homophobe, transphobe, Islamophobe Charles McVitie is being supported and rewarded awarded by this government. If his bigotry doesn't give this government pause, then his dubious academic background and his questionable financial arrangements should. We've had a lot of opportunity to think about the need for decency in political life as we have watched the machinations and behavior of the, I hope, outgoing President of the United States. The support of Char Charles McVitie is not decent. Will the Premier do the decent thing and withdraw Schedule 2 from Bill 213 and cut McVitie loose? Order. The Minister of Colleges and Universities to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I've talked about the process, and the process is critical. It's critical for a reason, Mr. Speaker. The most fundamental freedom we have under the Charter is Section 7 of the Charter, which says that everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of the person, and the right not to be deprived thereof, except in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice, Mr. Speaker. Fundamental justice, Mr. Speaker, and to the member opposite, is about procedural fairness. These are principles of procedural fairness, which are accountable and transparent. We cannot interfere with these types of procedural safeguards. It's wrong, Mr. Speaker. It violates the principles of fundamental justice. I ask no one in this House to accept or adopt beliefs that they don't hold. I accept Bots. no one to do anything of that nature. I ask that you simply accept the principles of fundamental justice and the principles of fairness. The supplementary question. So, Mr. Speaker, if I were asking for interference in the PCAB process, then that answer would have been perfectly legitimate. That's not what I'm asking about. I'm asking about a political decision to preempt that very process. But, Mr. Speaker, I have a very personal question for the Premier if he refuses to end this support of McVitie, and maybe the minister can pass it along to him. Can the Premier please provide an explanation for his behaviour to all the lesbian and gay and trans and Muslim parents in the province, to all the educators and grandparents and families who will have to explain to their LGBTQ and Muslim children why their government would support a man who despises and loathes them and the people they love? Because if the Premier cannot come up with an explanation, then the only explanation available to all of us is that he agrees with Charles McVitie. Or maybe if he doesn't agree with Charles McVitie, then the man did the Premier a favour and now he expects the Premier to do him a favour. The problem with that, Mr. Speaker, is that this man to whom the Premier is returning a favour is full of hate. Yeah. He is dangerous. I'm going to ask the member to withdraw. 
Impute, you can't impute motive. Place your I asked the Premier what he suggests we tell our children and grandchildren. What does he suggest I say to Olivia, Claire and Hugh about why their government is rewarding someone who believes that their grandma and their gagey and their uncle are evil? Mr. Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What the member opposite just asked, what I've been hearing over and over again, is that we interfere with independent processes. There's a request that the government interfere and meddle with independent processes. There is no way to stand in the way of a PCAP process. There is no way to stand in the way of an independent process. But I know that the member opposite, when she stood as Premier, I know that that happened quite often, Mr. Speaker. We can go through numerous scandals that happened, numerous issues that arose. And look no further than now the leader of the Liberal Party, the new leader appointed by that Premier to be the Minister of Transportation, that is Stephen Del Duca, the leader of the Ontario Liberal Party, the former member for Vaughan, the former Minister of Transportation. We can talk about Response. You know, getting swimming pools built. We can talk about doing things like you know, go stations to avoid procedural fairness rules. We don't meddle with procedural fairness, Mr. Speaker. Those are the right things. The next question. The member for Nickelbelt. My question goes to the Minister of Health. Ontario must have a plan in case there are more critically ill patients than our hospital can serve. On March 28, the government sent a widely condemned critical care tri triage protocol to Ontario Hospital. The Ontario Human Rights Commission many disability organizations, and even the government's own bioethic table have called on the government to cancel that protocol. The critical care triage protocol has been criticized for allowing discrimination against people with disability who would find themselves in need of life-saving medical care. With a dozen major intensive care units now operating at capacity, this can become a life or death issue for people with disability in a not too distant future. In line with the unanimous advice of our own Question. bioethic table, the Human Rights Commission, the OAD Alliance, will the minister cancel her discriminatory March 28 critical care triage protocol? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you very much for raising that because that really deserves clarification. I can tell you that I had nothing to do with any kind of triage protocol such as this. It would have been done by health experts, not by me. I am un I'm aware of something that did exist in draft form. It never saw the light of day in terms of coming to reality. And quite frankly, I find the whole approach extremely offensive. Ageism is illegal. If anyone in our long-term care homes needs medical care, they will receive it, and that's exactly what's happening. So I, I reject any premise that anyone is acting on any draft of any kind of, of nature such as this. Thank you. The supplementary question. Two months ago, the government's bioethic table gave recommendations to the Minister of Health on the rules that should govern critical care triage to replace the March 28 critical care triage protocol that has been sent to every Ontario hospital already. Despite the Premier's promise of full transparency in the handling of this pandemic, the government has kept the critical care triage protocol kind of a secret. Her minister doesn't know about it. Ontarian people with disability, we all deserve to know what directive the government is considering in this life and death decision-making process. The minister owned Bioetic Table, the Ontario Human Rights Commission, and major respected disability organizations are urging the Minister of Health to immediately release the Bioetic Table's recommendation presently being considered. Will the minister immediately make public the recommendation of the government's Bioetic Table on critical care triage, and will she consult with people with disability on the rules that should govern critical care triage? Response, Parliament. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Uh, obviously, the health and well-being of all Ontarians is our top priority, and the March 28th draft critical triage protocol for a major surge in COVID-19 pandemic was developed by a bioethics table. 
but has been rescinded and should not be implemented or relied on. And this early draft and any subsequent draft documents developed for engagement and consultation should not be used. A revised framework may be shared in the future and distributed uh, should pandemic conditions deteriorate significantly in the province. Our government has uh, also introduced our comprehensive $2.8 billion Keeping Ontarians Response. Safe Plan, which will ensure that the province is ready to respond to several situations for COVID-19 and uh, implementation of our plan is well underway. We don't anticipate getting anywhere near having to use such a protocol. And Thank you very much. The next question, member for Glendary Prescott Russell. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Monsieur le Président, ma question My question goes to the Premier. It's hard to believe that the government continues to justify, to justify its sneaky measures in Bill 213 which gives the important power to grant university degrees to a homophobic and Islamophobic man who continues to spread hatred. A Mr. McVitie, a great friend of the Premier's, it seems. I've never really heard of this man before. So let's face it, have, after hearing him, I could have done it without him. If you want to have nightmares, listen to this man talk. It will send shivers down your spine. Back home, we put it aside, people. We put aside people like that. But here with this government, it looks like they're, uh, w they are being rewarded with the power to grant universities in arts and in science. Unbelievable. Why would the prime minister and his government want to grant such powers to a homophobic, Islamophobic and hateful man? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to expand on this a little bit more because we've been having this conversation all week. The process is the most critical element of what, what I referred to earlier, our fundamental justice. Fundamental justice requires that we have procedural safeguards. So anyone who wants to apply for a license or a designation, as I said before, has to be guaranteed a process. I'm not sure if the members opposite I'm not sure what they would like me to do. Would they like me to wait outside of the computer system, hack the computer systems in order to stop an application from happening? No, Order. that is not reasonable, and that is not what we can do. There is a process. Now, the Response. fact that we're in this Order. house and we're able to speak about this brings it out into a public domain that is transparent. That is why we're here, Mr. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker government answer the simple question. Do they stand against hate, homophobia and Islamophobia, yes or no? If yes, they will remove the schedule that they snuck into Bill 213 that encourages it. If they don't, they will keep it. So will the government do the right thing and remove Schedule 2 of Bill 213, yes or no? The Minister of Colleges and Universities. Mr. Mr. Speaker, as I've indicated, we obviously respect every element of fundamental justice, everything within the Charter, equality rights, and we absolutely stand for principles of justice. We obviously do not stand for hate. But these are not synonymous as they want to be set out by the members of the opposition. What is in the bill is not synonymous at all with what they are referencing. In fact, it is all about procedural fairness, as we have said time and time and time again. It is critical that we be able to enter into this chamber and have respectful debate. It is critical that we ensure that everyone has the opportunity to follow a process and that there is a clear line of what that process is. Response. While we sit in this chamber, we have to be able to have respectful debate, and that is what we would hope for. Mr. Speaker, we are all about transparency and accountability and procedural fairness, and that is what we are doing. Thank you. The next question, the member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, last month, the Minister for Small Businesses and the member from Scarborough Centre visited Cosmetica, a makeup factory, because the owner wanted to reduce red, uh, red tape. This company is the same company that forced workers who feared for their own safety and health uh, of, their, of their family members to continue working during this pandemic because this government made a makeup factory essential. And after taking advantage of these workers, 180 workers were terminated. Mr. Speaker, the, the regulations that protect our workers are not red tape. They are the basic rights of workers that should be upheld in this province. Can the minister explain 
what backroom deals were made with Cosmetica after they fired 180 workers. Minister of Labour. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, thank you uh, to the member opposite for uh, raising uh, this uh, issue today at, at Queen's Park, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the health and safety of every single worker has been the government's top priority uh, during COVID-19, Mr. Speaker. That's why uh, we recently announced uh, that we're hiring actually more than 100 uh, labour inspectors. That'll be the most uh, labour inspectors that the province has ever had uh, in its history. That's why we've doubled the capacity at the, the phone line uh, center at the Ministry of Labour. If any worker uh, is uh, afraid for his or her uh, safety on the job, they can call 877-202-0008, and the Ministry of Labour, Training and Skills Development will investigate uh, uh, the, the uh, concerns that uh, any worker has. Uh, Mr. Speaker, furthermore, I Response? would uh, let the member opposite know that they can visit ontario.ca forward slash COVID safety to see the more than 200 uh, resources available uh, to workers and to every employer in the province. And the supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, over the last months, I've been fighting for these workers who were laid off by Cosmetica. These employees were laid off by a company only to be replaced by workers through the agency simply to save money by this company. The employees weren't given, and some of these employees weren't given, a record of employment and explained their severance packages. So when I reached out to the Minister of Labour in September to let him know about these issues and asked for help because these 180 workers wanted help and without exposing themselves, they wanted the Minister to ask Cosmetica so they could be explained what, what their record of employment looked like and how much severance were paid. The Minister simply refused and told them to expose themselves and actually file a complaint with the ESA. So will the minister explain why he is unwilling to help Ontario's workers because the suppression of workers' rights by this government has reached a devastatingly high level and it is unacceptable. Question. Can the minister explain why he's unwilling to help these workers, Mr. Speaker? And the Minister of Labour to reply. To the contrary, this government is standing up with workers every single day. That, that were in office, Mr. Speaker. Uh, in fact, the very first uh, legislation that we brought forward during COVID-19 was Bill 186, the most progressive legislation in North America. Order. Mr. Speaker, that legislation, that law that was Order. supported by all members in this House tells any Order. worker if they're in self-isolation, if they're in quarantine, if they have to stay home and look after uh, a loved one, Member for uh, Scarborough they Southwest. can't be fired Come for that. We expect Every single labor law to be uh, followed in this in this province, and if they're not, Mr. Speaker, there'll be penalties to pay. House will come to order. That concludes our question period for this morning. Pursuant to Standing Order 36A, the member for Ottawa South has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Parliamentary Assistant, the Minister of Health, concerning testing and long-term care. This matter will be debated Tuesday, November 17th, following private members' public business. This House stands in recess until 1 p.m.